Good morning everyone, uh, welcome back to this GCSE chemistry live group tutorial and um, I hope everyone had a good break, a nice bank holiday weekend um, and you're all back and ready to continue learning um, with our tutors this week. We've got lots of um, live group tutorials for you in various subjects. So this is the first one today, um, it's GCSE chemistry as I said um, and the topic is chemical equations and separating mixtures. Um, so I can see that lots of you have joined us before, which is great, um, and some new faces as well. So welcome if you haven't joined us for one of these live group tutorials before. As usual, this will run for one hour, so we'll be finishing at quarter to 11 this morning. And um, we will have um, questions available, um, so you can pop those in the chat down at the bottom or the Q&A, and we'll do our best to answer them. So I'm Tilly, I work at my tutor, I'll just be here answer any questions you might have about the online school and our tutor today is Armin who is a fantastic chemistry tutor he's been with us for a really long time um, has done over 150 lessons with us and studies medicine at King's College London so it should be a really great session today any questions um, just let us know um, someone's asking just in the chat to start with um, why are some of the lessons overlapping today um, just today due to um, availability and us um, having an extended schedule essentially um, a couple of the lessons um, overlap a little bit what we're doing is trying our best to make sure that um, they're not overlapping um, but just today um, there are a couple of cases of that happening um, but there are lots of other sessions later today so I'll, um, I'll let you know at the end of today's tutorial what's happening with those but um, Armin if you're all ready then let's kick off. Hi everyone welcome back um, so as Tilly said today we'll be doing chemical equations and separating mixtures and um, so we're still sticking within the topic of structure and bonding um, so we'll start off with chemical, chemical equations then. Um, so the first thing that we need to know is what are reactants and what are products? So you might remember um, that when we see an equation, like the equation down here, that the reactants are what we start with. So this is the equation for respiration. So we've got glucose here plus oxygen. So we start with those, we react those together to then form our products of carbon dioxide and water. And the key thing is that all equations must be balanced. So if we look at our equation for respiration, we can see that we've got some balancing going on. So if we look at carbon in the glucose, there are six of them on the um, reactant side and on the product side, there are also six carbons. And one thing I want to point out today that we will be doing some balancing of equations because I think it's a key skill to have. Um, but what you'll notice is that we don't like odd numbers. And by that, I mean that when we're thinking about how many of each we have on the reactant and product side, we tend not to have odd numbers. Um, and that's because to balance equations, it's a lot easier to have odd num um, to have even numbers. Whereas if we have odd numbers, we tend to need fractions. Um, and that's not what we have in balanced equations. We tend to have whole numbers. So to avoid fractions, we try and have even numbers. Um, and we'll be doing lots of examples of those today. Um, so, so I can show you that. So just to say that what balanced means is that there are the same number of atoms on each side of the equation. So we can see that in our respiration equation. As I said, there are six carbons on both sides. There are um, 12 hydrogens on the reactant side and six times two on the product side is 12. Six oxygens on um, the reactant side in glucose plus the 12 oxygens here. So that makes 18. And then if we look on the product side, we have 12 oxygens in carbon dioxide and six in water, so that makes 18 again. Um, so everything there is balanced. So the next thing that we need to know then is about the law of conservation of mass. And this says that the total mass of reactants is equal to the total mass of products. And often in questions, they ask you what the law of conservation of mass is and why that, ma uh, that law exists. And the reason for that is that atoms can neither be created nor destroyed. So they always stay the same. So the numbers will always stay the same and the mass always stays the same. And that's why our equations are always balanced because we can't put more atoms in and then get less out. It's always the same. Um, so they cannot be created or destroyed. The other thing that's important with our balanced equations is state symbols. Now, I appreciate it can sometimes be difficult if we don't know whether something's a liquid, solid or gas. But what is really important is that if you do know what something is to just put it in. So, for example, we know that hydrogen goes around as a gas, so we can put that state symbol in. 
We know that oxygen goes around as a gas. We know that a lot of the metals are solids. Someone is asking, is this equation nearly the same as the energy formula? Um, so the equation that we were looking at on slide one was the um, formula for respiration, so how we respire. So um, if I go back to this slide here, so the one thing I do want to point out is the aqueous. So that is in brackets AQ. And we need to know what aqueous means. That means it's dissolved in water. So last week, someone asked me, um, what's the difference between hydrogen chloride and hydrochloric acid. Now the difference is what I said last week was that it's dissolved in water. So hydrogen chloride is a covalently bonded molecule. So you remember from last week that covalent bonding occurs between two non-metals, which hydrogen and chlorine are. And if we dissolve it in water, we form hydrochloric acid. So it's an aqueous solution. So if you see HCl written like this, we're thinking about um, hydrochloric acid. So let's balance some equations then. Um, we'll start with the top one over here. So as I said, we want to try and make everything equal because atoms are neither um, created nor destroyed. So if we start with the process at the top, does anyone know what the process is when we add nitrogen to hydrogen? Um, what this equation is showing here. Nitrogen and hydrogen are added together to form ammonia. Does anyone know what that process is called? Yep, yeah, brilliant. So someone's told me it's the harbour process. That's exactly correct. So that's something that we'll get onto at a later date, um, but it is one of the key equations that you need to know at GCSE. Um, so it's the production of ammonia through the hydrogen process where we add nitrogen from the air to hydrogen. There's usually some kind of catalyst there and we form ammonia. So to balance this equation, um, we need to make everything equal. So the way that I like to do this is to first look at what's unbalanced and what is currently balanced. So if we have a look at our nitrogen, we've got two on the reactant side. Remember the reactants are on the left hand side of the equation. They're what we add together to then form our product of ammonia. But we have one on the right hand side. So at the moment, our nitrogens do not equate. On the reactant side, we have two hydrogens. And on the product side, we have three hydrogens. So again, they do not equate or they're not equal to each other. Now, this is an example of where I said we have an odd number. So we have three hydrogens there. Now, if we wanted to balance the hydrogen on the reactant side, to the hydrogens on the product side, we would have to make this two a fraction. So we would have to make this three over two because 1.5 times hydrogen of two makes three, which would be balanced. But remember I said we don't like fractions in balanced equations. So to avoid that, we need to make our hydrogens um, even. So we could put a two here. And then what we find is that that balances our nitrogens. We now have two nitrogens on the reactant and the product side. We now have two times three, so six hydrogens, which means that we need a three here to make six hydrogens. So well done to everyone that sent me in um, that balanced equation, you were exactly correct. Um, I'm just trying to explain how when we have odd numbers, we don't like them because otherwise you'll need to put in a fraction. So the next one here, um, does anyone know what type of equation this one is? So this is potassium chlorate forming potassium chloride and oxygen. So this is potassium chlorate. And um, the reason it's called chlorate, so it's because the eight at the end of a word tends to indicate that there's oxygen in there. So potassium chloride, does anyone know what type of reaction um, that is? Someone's saying oxidation, not quite. So I'm not thinking in terms of oxidation or reduction here. Brilliant, so someone's saying decomposition, you're exactly correct. Um, and the reason we know it's a decomposition reaction is because we've got a reactant of potassium chlorate and it's forming two or more products, it's decomposing. So essentially it's just broken down into um, two constituent parts of potassium chloride and oxygen. So exactly correct, it is a decomposition um, reaction. Well done to everyone trying to balance it. Um, so let's have a go at doing that then. So first of all, we can see our potassiums, one, on the reactant side, one on the uh, product side, so that means our potassium is um, equal or balanced. Chlorine, one, chlorine, one, so again, balanced. Oxygen, three, oxygen, two. So our oxygens are the ones that are not balanced at the moment. So if we have a look then, again, we've got an odd number over here. So we want to make that even because otherwise to balance it, we would have to make this oxygen um, a fraction. So again, it would have to be three over two. Now you may think, but that's balanced the whole equation. If we put that three over two there, we've balanced it. But remember, we can't really have one and a half oxygens. 
doesn't really happen. We have to have a whole number there. So to make that a whole number, we need to make the potassium chlorate doubled. We put a two there, and therefore we have oxygen as an even number. We have two times three, six oxygens. So that means we put a three here to make this six oxygens. And now if we have a look, we've got two potassiums and two chlorines. So to make that equal, we put a two here. So the final balanced equation will be two potassium chlorates goes to two potassium chlorides plus three oxygens. So again, very well done um, to everyone that gave me that answer. Okay, sorry, this equation seems to have messed up slightly, so I'll just write it out again. So C3H8, does anyone know what C3H8 is? And does anyone know what type of reaction this is? So I've got lots of um, answers coming in that C3H8 is methane, ethane, propane. So remember that the, the, it relates to how many carbons there are. So which um, hydrocarbon has three carbons in it? Remember this has got three carbons in it. Propane, exactly. Very well done, everyone. And everyone is saying this is a combustion reaction. That's exactly correct. So for those that don't know, combustion is when a hydrocarbon reacts with oxygen. It combusts to form carbon dioxide and water. And that's a pretty standard equation. Any hydrocarbon will combust to form carbon dioxide and water. So when it reacts with oxygen. Someone's asking, are they all high, half ionic equations? These are not half ionic equations, no. Um, if they were half ionic equations, we would ex expect them to be charged. We've not got any charged um, particles at the moment. We won't be doing half ionic equations today. That will be done in a later um, lesson. So we've got propane over here. So remember, propane is an alkane. It's a hydrocarbon. We're adding it to oxygen. It's combusting to form carbon dioxide and water. So let's have a look what isn't balanced then. We've got three carbons on the reactant side, but only one on the product side. We've got eight hydrogens, but only two on the product side. Again, not balanced. Two oxygens, but we've got three oxygens, so two in carbon dioxide and one in water. So again, not balanced. So everything is not balanced at the moment. So it's up to you where you start. Often it can be a bit overwhelming. What do we change first? But often you just have to have a play around until everything matches. So I'm actually going to start with the oxygens um, because I know that, for example, our hydrogens um, are balanced at the moment. Um, so if we have a look, though, if I do start with the oxygens, we've got two on the reactant side and three on the product side. So we know already that we're going to need to even out something. And we know that we have three carbons and um, eight hydrogens. So actually, if I start with carbon, we've got three carbons here. So if I make this a three, let's have a look what happens. So we've got our three carbons, that's fine. And this is one of the um, times when we can have an odd number because we're not forming a fraction when we multiply up. If we do that, we then end up with six oxygens and we've got the one from um, water, that makes seven. But they have here two. So again, that doesn't make sense. But if we have a look at our hydrogens, we've got eight. So what that means is that we need to put a four here to make eight hydrogens. And now if we have a look at our waters, we have six plus four, which is 10. So if we put a five here, we end up with 10. So I'm going to go through that one again because that one was quite tricky. We had to change a lot of numbers. So as I said, just start off with one of them. So you can start off with oxygen, hydrogen or water. So this time, let's start off um, with hydrogen. So if we start with hydrogen, we can see there that there are two on the product side and eight on the reactant side. So to equate those, we need to put a big four in front of our water. And that means that we'll have eight waters, um, or sorry, eight hydrogens as well as eight waters. And then we can see that we have one carbon on the product side, but three on the reactant side. So if we put a three here, that would work. And again, the reason we can keep that odd is because we don't need a fraction there to make that three carbons. So then what we can see is that we've got three carbons, three carbons, they're balanced. If we look at our hydrogens, we've got eight hydrogens, eight hydrogens, they're balanced. So the final thing to look at is oxygen. We have two oxygens on the reactant side, but on the product side, we have six plus four. So three times two is six plus four, which is 10. 
that means we need a five here to make five times two, 10. So that is the fully complete balanced equation of combustion of propane. Someone's asked me just to scroll up um, so you can see the other two equations there. So we had the harbor process of ammonia being formed from nitrogen and hydrogen, um, and you have potassium chlorate decomposing to potassium chloride and oxygen. So someone's asking, would you lose marks um, if you do multiples of the equation? So you can um, lose marks, yes. Um, and the reason for that is that it should always be, just like in maths, it, maths, it should always be the simplest equation that you can. So simplify it as far as possible. Um, but remember, so for example, we know this is the simplest equation because we have odd numbers. So if we have odd numbers there, we can't halve them because if we did, we'd end up with fractions. And remember I said, we don't like fractions in balanced equations. So someone's asking me, can we do um, more balancing of equations? We will do. Um, at the end, I've got a couple more to do. The reason we're not doing them right now is because I want to go on to separating mixtures um, so that we have time to do some exam questions as well. So we will. So for now, we've done three um, and we'll do a couple more um, at the end of the session. So before I move on, are there any more questions on balancing equations um, or anything else that anyone wants to ask? Otherwise, we'll move on to separating mixtures. OK, um, so let's move on then. Um, actually, just before we do, someone's asking, is this for higher or is this for foundation? Um, so this is for both. You will need to know how to balance equations for both foundation and the higher tier. Um, for foundation tier, often um, they're a little bit simpler. For the higher tier, what can happen is that you need to be able to decide what type of compound is formed. So we're going to come on to that in a second. Um, but for example, if they say you form calcium chloride, you're going to need to know what um, calcium chloride is and how to know what um, chemical formula it has. Someone's asking, can we also do fractional distillation for hydrocarbons? So, yep, it's called fractional distillation of crude oil. Um, we won't be covering that today. We're doing fractional distillation tomorrow. So today we're doing the basic. Um, so we're doing filtration, crystallization um, and simple distillation today. Can you separate the carbon from hydrogen? Um, I don't know what you mean there. Um, so propane, remember, that is bonded together. We've got covalent bonds between um, carbon and hydrogen atoms. So remember that's a non-metal, so we have covalent bonds there. So as I was saying, if we're trying to form the chemical formula of calcium chloride for the higher tier, they might just write um, a equation saying that calcium plus chlorine makes calcium chloride, and you need to know how to write the chemical equation of calcium chloride. So calcium chloride, I'm just going to show you now how you would do that. So it's all to do with um, the ionic um, states and the ionic equations that you would expect to see with calcium and chlorine. So if we look at calcium, on our periodic table, which um, we would have an atomic number, and it's uh, also about what group it's in. So does anyone know what group calcium is in? Yep, it's in group two. So that means it has two electrons in its outer shell. So calcium is a metal. Remember, metals like to lose electrons. So calcium will lose its two outer electrons to form a two plus ion. And that's really important. And then what about chlorine? What group is chlorine in? Group seven, excellent, well done. So if it's in group seven, that means it has seven electrons in its outer shell. And that means it likes to gain one electron to form its outer shell. And if it gains an electron, remember it has more electrons than protons and it has one more electron. So it forms a minus one charge. So if we want to combine calcium and chloride to form a compound, in order to write that, there's two methods that you can use. The first method is to think, OK, so calcium has two electrons to lose, but chlorine can only gain one. That means if calcium wants to lose its two electrons, it must lose its two electrons to two chlorines. So Ca, Cl, 2. So in the higher tier, you would have to be able to form that chemical formula just through using the ionic charges. The other way that I used at school was to swap the charges. So what we can see here is that what's happening is calcium becomes a 1 and chlorine becomes a 2. So it becomes CaCl2. So you've just swapped them. Um, so that's just a quicker way. But I often think it's easier just to think about what's happening um, in order to decide what type of chemical formula um, you will form there. So that's the difference between the foundation and the higher tier. In the foundation tier, you wouldn't be expected um, to be able to write out those chemical formulas, but in the higher tier, you would be expected to use the ionic charges to do that. 
Okay, so let's go on to separating mixtures. So first of all, we need to know what a mixture is. Now, you, some of you may remember this diagram from um, a couple of weeks ago when we looked at the differences um, between states of matter, and we thought about what an element is, what a compound is, and what a mixture is. If we're thinking about separating mixtures, we need to be really clear on what a mixture is. So just to go through this diagram again, Remember, elements contain only one type of atom. So we can see that in this red diagram here, there's only one type of atom. Again, in this one, there's only one type of atom. Although they're going around in pairs, there's only one type of atom. So this could be oxygen going around in pairs. And remember, oxygen forms a diatomic molecule. It goes around in pairs, but it's still an element. A compound, remember, this is made of more than one type of element that is chemically combined. And that key part of the definition there they must be chemically combined so what we can see is that this blue particle is joined to these red particles here and this blue particle is joined to this red particle so they're chemically combined and they're formed of more than one element so this for example could be sodium chloride because we know sodium chloride has one sodium for every one chlorine and this could be water so for example the red um, could be the hydrogens where we have h2 and the blue could be oxygen so h2o again H2O is a molecule, but it's also a compound because it's formed of more than one element that is chemically combined. So today we're thinking about mixtures and the difference with mixtures is we've got two or more elements in there and they are, can be two or more elements, compounds or a mix. So if we have a look at this one here, this is an element, this is a compound. So we've got a mix of an element and a compound in there. Um, and over here, for example, we've got a compound and two types of elements. And over here, what we can see is that we have two types of elements, but the key thing is they're not chemically combined. So in, mix in mixtures, they will not be chemically combined. So you may have some chemical combinations if there's a compound in there, but you can see it's not chemically combined to the element. And that means that it, they can be separated using physical methods, which is what we're about to go on to, and that they have no fixed composition. So no fixed composition means that the proportions of elements and compounds in there can be changed. So for example, if I'm adding salt to water, we know that salt is sodium chloride and it dissolves in water. I could add loads and loads of salt. The mixture will have different proportions of salt and water in there. Okay, so that's what a mixture is. It can have different proportions of the elements and compounds. There's no defined kind of proportion. Whereas in compounds, we know that, for example, water has to be H2O. Um, but in mixtures, that isn't the case. Is polymerization the opposite of separation? So sort of, but not really. So polymerization happens um, with hydrocarbons. So for example, um, propane that we looked at earlier can polymerize. Um, it's kind of polymerization tends to be kind of a key thing with hydrocarbons as I said separation is all about mixtures it's not really about hydrocarbons and um, obviously we can separate hydrocarbons using fractional distillation which we'll get onto tomorrow um, but not all mixtures can be um, uh, polymerized for example so let's go on to our first one then and um, this is the one that we often do at school it's filtration and um, so some of you may have done this at school and um, so what we've got here is we've got some sand um, and with sandy water and what we're doing is we're pouring this sandy water into filter paper and um, so filter paper the reason that what happens when we pour that in the sand stays in the filter paper but the water drops through is because that filter paper has tiny little pores in it or tiny little holes so it's really important um, that we understand that so the reason the liquid what we call the filtrate so remember the filtrate is what's left after we've got rid of all the insoluble solid so remember salt sorry um, sand is insoluble in water so insoluble means that it does not dissolve in water and that means that the sand will stay in this filter paper when we try and filter it but the water will seep through the little holes in the filter paper and come through to form the filtrate. So someone's asking, can you go back to the mixture slide? Yes, I can. Um, so that's back to the mixture slide again. Um, so remember that they, these can be separated using physical methods. There's no fixed composition. So remember, there's no fixed proportions of each of the elements or compounds in there, and they're not chemically combined. Okay, so back to filtration. So if we look at filtration again, 
Um, so as I said, this is sandy water. We're adding it to the filter paper and the sand stays in that filter paper, but the water seeps through and that's because of the tiny holes in there. So in an exam question, you might be asked um, about something where you've got an obvious solid in water or in some kind of solvent um, and you'd be asked what type of method you would use to separate them. So the key thing is filtration. If you've ever got something insoluble, so insoluble doesn't dissolve, and some kind of liquid, some kind of solvent, filtration is the method to separate them. And again, it's about these tiny holes that I talked about that allows them to be separated. Um, and there's one other technique. So sometimes you're asked, how can you improve um, this experiment? Someone's asking, is chromatography a separation technique too? It is, yes, we will be doing chromatography tomorrow. So we'll be doing paper chromatography tomorrow. So um, if someone asks you how to improve an experiment in exam questions, they do tend to do that. The one thing you can do is after this has been filtered, we can wash the sand with distilled water. And that all that will do is remove any of the solution that is left. So it's just kind of almost um, a purification technique, which is making sure it is just sand there and we've got rid of all of that solvent. So if we wash it with distilled water afterwards, it's just almost like an extra step. So that's filtration. So the key thing we need to know is it's separating insoluble substances like sand from soluble substances. So sand and water. So we're separating those. Crystallization um, is the next one. So I've drawn this diagram here of crystallization. Um, it's a relatively new topic in the GCSE syllabus. Um, so there aren't many exam questions on it. But often um, when I have seen exam questions, they, they're long answer questions um, and you start by doing filtration and then you do crystallization. And the reason for that is because often if we imagine this sandy water back here, let's say um, that this is seawater. What does anyone know what else seawater has dissolved in it? So sand doesn't dissolve, but something does dissolve in seawater. What does dissolve in seawater? Salt. Excellent. So salt dissolves in seawater. So if we want to separate that salt from the seawater, we can't fil use filtration because salt is dissolved. So salt isn't going to stay in the filter paper, but the sand does because sand doesn't dissolve. So what we can do is use crystallization or we can use distillation. So let's think about crystallization first. So crystallization talks about when we've got a soluble salt from a salt solution. So let's leave seawater for a second and think about copper sulfate and copper sulfate solution. So remember the aqueous means that it's dissolved in water and copper sulfate is a solid. So copper sulfate will dissolve in its salt solution. And what that means is we can't use filtration to separate it. But what we can do is use crystallization. So if we use something called an evaporating dish, so this is this gray thing here. So this is an evaporating dish. And in there, we add in our solution. So we add in our copper solid dissolved in the copper sulfate solution. We then use our Bunsen burner to heat up that evaporating dish. And notice how I'm not heating the evaporating dish directly. I'm using a beaker of water. So it's what's called a water bath. And the reason for that is some um, times if we heat the evaporating dish too, um, too much, we don't get what we want with the crystallization, which is that we want a few crystals to form and then we stop. So the reason for that is if I heat this up, um, the evaporating dish will start to, um, well, the water in the copper sulfate will start to evaporate, leaving copper sulfate solid. But you'll remember if you've done this experiment that we don't just wait until all the water has evaporated. We wait until a little bit of a few crystals form. So a few crystals of copper sulfate. So when a few crystals of copper sulfate have formed, we stop heating and we let it then um, evaporate the last remaining parts of water evaporate um, at room temperature. So we don't want the water to evaporate too quickly because then we're not going to form as many solids or as many crystals. And the key thing here, it says that if we can, we'll use a Petri dish. Does anyone know why we use a Petri dish when we're um, allowing it to cool off at room temperature? So while we're allowing the last remaining crystals to form, why do we use a Petri dish instead of an evaporating dish? Why do we change it over? Someone's saying it's clear, not quite. Someone's saying to avoid contamination from air. Okay, so again, not quite. So the, what we want is a large surface area. So if we want the remaining water to evaporate from that copper sulfate to just form the crystals, we want a large surface area to allow that evaporation to occur. So a Petri dish allows for a larger surface area. 
So what is the difference between both dishes? So this is an evaporating dish. Um, remember, a Petri dish tends to be more rounded like this, and you just have it all exposed to the air. Whereas a Petri dish, because it's rounded, um, it's not going to be exposed to the air as much as a Petri dish. So it's about that large surface area here compared to here, where we've got this. Um, remember a Petri dish as well, that all the um, solution will be right at the top, whereas in the evaporating dish, we don't fill it all up. So it's to do with the large surface area. So just as a quick recap of crystallization, it's done when we've got a soluble salt, so something dissolved in a solvent or in a filtrate. So remember, I've, I've put there filtrate. So if, for example, we've got a solid dissolved in something, and then there's also um, a solid not dissolved, then the insoluble salt will be dissolved by filtration, and then the soluble substance will use crystallization for, where we evaporate off all the water or all the solvent, and once that's evaporated, it will form some crystallization. And it's really important that we stop when we see the first signs of crystals and then just allow the remaining water to evaporate at room temperature so that we can get maximum crystal formation. Um, and I have seen actually in mark schemes that you do tend to get marks for saying you stop heating when crystallization just begins or just starts. So it is something that the examiners are looking for. Someone's asking, what's the definition of aqueous again? So it means dissolved in water. Okay, so copper sulfate solution dissolved in water. Okay, so the final um, separation technique that we're looking at today is simple distillation. So that we're, we'll, we will look at fractional distillation tomorrow, but let's look at simple distillation now. Um, I will go back to filtration in just a second. Let's go through simple distillation first. So remember I talked about seawater and pure water. So I said um, that in seawater we might have sand, so we filter that to remove the sand, and then what we're left with is seawater, just water. And in there, lots of people have said we've got salt dissolved. Now the reason we don't use crystallization is because if we do that, we'll be left with salt. Now what do we actually want from seawater? Do we want the salt? What do we want? Why would we try and separate seawater? And as a clue, it's on the diagram. So we want pure water, exactly. So well done to everyone that said that. We want pure water. So the reason we don't use crystallization is because if we did, all that pure water would evaporate and we'd form salts. We don't want a, a salt, we want pure water. So the opposite of crystallization is simple distillation. It's where we want the solvent. We don't want what's dissolved, we want the solvent. So crystallization, you get what's dissolved, but in simple distillation, we get the solvent. So what happens? is we have something here called a round bottom flask. So this is what the seawater is in. We heat it up using a Bunsen burner again. And eventually, the water in the seawater will evaporate. Does anyone know why the water evaporates and not the salt? Why does the salt in the seawater not evaporate? Because we can evaporate salt, or we can evaporate the salty water. Why does it not? Very, very close. So a lot of people have said at lower boiling point. So the water has a lower boiling point, but the salt has a higher boiling point. So when we heat it up, the water will evaporate first because it has a lower boiling point. So remember, boiling is going from liquid to gas. So any water in this seawater will evaporate. It will become a gas at a lower boiling point than salt will. So when we evaporate it, it goes into this condenser. So what's the function of the condenser? Anyone know what's the function of the condenser? And why have we got water coming in and water coming out of the condenser? Excellent, so it does exactly what it says. It condenses that water. So the water that we've evaporated from the seawater will go into the condenser and it will cool down. And the reason it cools down is because we've got water flowing in and flowing out. So as the water flows in and out, so it's surrounding this tube here, that water vapour, so the evaporated water, as gas particles, will cool down, it will condense. And then the function of that is that it drips into this beaker to form pure water. So what we'd be left with in the flask is salt, because we will evaporate all that water. And as people have said, it's because water has a lower boiling point. Exactly, as everyone said, it cools the water vapour down into a liquid, so the water flows through to, um, to keep it cool, um, and it's to turn the water back from a gas to a liquid. Excellent, very well done everyone. So as I said, we're left with salt in this round bottom flask and we form pure water in this beaker here. 
So that's the three techniques, filtration, crystallization, and distillation. So someone asked me to go back to filtration, so I'll go back to filtration there. Um, while I'm back on filtration, are there any questions um, about any of those techniques? Someone's asking, in distillation, we get salt and water, don't we? Yes, we do. So in the round bottom flask, what we started with, you'd be left with salt. In the beaker, you'd be left with pure water, which is what people want from seawater. So remember, we, do, we can't drink seawater because it's got too much salt in it. We can only drink pure water. Yep, we can do exam questions. We're about to go on to some now. Okay, so there's no more questions about those separation techniques. So let's do some exam questions then. So this is um, not an exam question, it's from a textbook, um, but the reason I brought it up is because um, I think it's highlighting one of the key points about um, some of the separation techniques. So let's have a look at this question and see. There are two ways to answer it. So sulfur is soluble in the flammable liquid xylene, but not in water. Sodium nitrate is soluble in water, but not xylene. Describe and explain two ways to separate a mixture of sulfur powder and sodium nitrate to collect pure samples of each solid. So I'm going to read that again. It's quite a long question. Sulfur is soluble in flammable liquid xylene, but it's not in water. Sodium nitrate is soluble in water, but not in xylene. Describe and explain two ways to separate a mixture of sulfur powder and sodium nitrate to collect pure samples of each solid. Okay, so as I said, there are two ways to go about this. Does anyone have any ideas? Okay. Um, excellent, so some people are saying filtration. Brilliant, so the first step is definitely filtration. But the key part in this question is you wouldn't get the mark for just saying filtration. It's about saying what you want to filter. So there are two, as I said, there are two ways to answer this question. So I'm going to take the sulfur way first and then we'll look at sodium nitrate. So sulfur is soluble in the flammable liquid xylene, but not in water. So if we want to filter, filter to get sulfur, let's dissolve the sulfur and sodium nitrate in water. And when we dissolve sulfur and sodium nitrate in water, the sodium nitrate will dissolve in that water but the sulfur won't, so it will form particles of solid. So to filter that, we can use filtration. I put our filter paper in, and then what will happen is we'll, left, we'll be left with solid, solid sulfur in the filter paper, but in our filtrate or in our beaker, we'd have sodium nitrate dissolved in water. And remember then we can add some distilled water afterwards just to make sure all of that filtrate has left the sulfur, so we're just left with sulf, uh, pure sulf, sulfur. So that's the first method. Then if we want to get rid of the sodium nitrate from dissolving uh, in, that's dissolved in that water, what can we do? So if we've removed the sulfur, we've now got sodium nitrate dissolved in water. What can we do to remove the sodium nitrate from the water? So we want the sodium nitrate, we don't want the water. Crystallization, excellent. So some people are saying distillation, some people are saying crystallization. So what I just said there was, we want the sodium nitrate, we don't want the water. So remember in crystallization, we get what's dissolved in the solvent. So at the moment, our sodium nitrate is dissolved in that water. So we want the sodium nitrate. But in distillation, we would get the water because we get the solvent and we're left with the sodium nitrate um, in the flask. And remember, it, because of the way that distillation works, you wouldn't be left with pure sodium nitrate. But crystallization, you would be. So we use crystallization, we don't use distillation. So we use crystallization, we heat up that solution of sodium nitrate and water. We wait until crystallization just begins. When it begins, we turn off that Bunsen burner and we allow the sodium nitrate to, um, to the water in the sodium nitrate to evaporate at room temperature or what's left in a Petri dish. Someone's asked me why we use a Petri dish. Again, it's because it has a larger surface area than an evaporating dish. And that means it will evaporate quicker. So that means there's more, um, Remember, evaporation is the process of the liquid becoming a gas. So at room temperature, that's still going to be warmer than it would be just in the solution. So it will evaporate a little bit slower than it would do in a Bunsen burner, um, and those particles become gas particles. The second method is to use sodium nitrate and use xylene. So we used water there. So now let's think about xylene. So it says sulfur is soluble in xylene, but sodium nitrate isn't. So if we put sulfur and sodium together in xylene, we could filter 
And what would happen is we'd end up with the sodium nitrate in the filter paper because it doesn't dissolve in xylene, but sulfur will dissolve in the, uh, in the xylene. So we'd end up with a solution of sulfur and xylene. And then if we want to separate those, again, we use crystallization to um, get the sulfur. So there's two ways of answering that question. Um, I thought it was a very clear question to just help you to understand filtration and crystallization. Okay. Um, right, so here again is an exam question then. As I said, there aren't many exam questions on these topics because they are relatively new. Um, a lot of exam questions focus on chromatography and fractional distillation, which we will be covering tomorrow. So rock salt is a mixture of sand and salt. Salt dissolves in water. Sand does not dissolve in water. Some students separated rock salt. This is the method used. Place the rock salt in a beaker, add 100 centimetres cube of cold water. Allow the sand to settle to the bottom of the beaker. Carefully pour the salty water into an evaporating dish. Heat the contents of the evaporating dish with a Bunsen burner until salt crystals start to form. Suggest one improvement to step two to make sure all the salt is dissolved in the water. So what could we do to make sure all the salt dissolves in water? Stir it, excellent. So people are saying stir it um, and we can actually increase the temperature as well. That does um, improve. Um, yep, stir it with a glass rod, excellent, well done. Um, so yep, so stirring or temperature increase would work. The salty water in step four still contained very small gra grains of sand. Suggest one improvement to step four to remove all the sand. What do we think? Filter it, excellent, we have to filter it. So they've not done any filtration. If we filter it, we'd remove the sand particles because remember the sand does not dissolve in that water. Suggest one safety precaution the students should take in step five. So step five is about heating the contents. So what safety precautions do we use at school? and um, when we're using a Bunsen burner. Wear goggles, excellent, don't touch the flame, tie hair back, all things like that, tuck in ties, excellent, very well done. Okay, another student removed water from salty water using the apparatus in the figure below. So there we go. Describe how this technique works by referring to the processes at A and B. So what process is happening at A and what process is happening at B? Good. So at A, we are evaporating that water. So remember, we're adding in heat. The salty water in this flask is then evaporating. And as that evaporates, it then goes to B. What happens at B? Condensation. Excellent. Very well done, everyone. So evaporation at A and at B, we get condensation. What is the reading on the thermometer during this process? So at what temperature does water boil? Excellent, very well done. Everyone's saying 100, so remember 100 degrees is the temperature that water will boil. Okay. Magnesium and dilute hydrochloric acid react to produce magnesium chloride solution and hydrogen. State two observations that could be made during this reaction. So we haven't covered this today, um, but I'm going to change this question first. I want to know what does aqueous mean? And why is hydrogen a gas? So a slight referring to um, what we did last week. So why is hydrogen a gas? Um, or why does it go around as a gas at room temperature? And what, what does aqueous mean? Aqueous means dissolved in water. Excellent, very well done. And why does hydrogen go around as a gas at room temperature? Referring to what we did last week, why does hydrogen go around as a gas at room temperature? What type of bonding do we have between hydrogen molecules? Yeah, brilliant. So weak intermolecular forces. So remember, between hydrogen molecules, there are covalent bonds between individual hydrogen molecules and they go around as pairs. But between molecules of hydrogen, so in the hydrogen, there's a covalent bond, but between molecules of hydrogen, there are these weak intermolecular forces represented by the dots. And they're what we break when we boil hydrogen and that's why hydrogen goes around as a gas so it has a low boiling point and it's really important you say boiling point not melting point because remember melting point refers to when a solid becomes a liquid boiling point refers to when a liquid becomes a gas so the reason hydrogen goes around as a gas at room temperature is because it has weak intermolecular forces between molecules of hydrogen and these require a, um, a little energy to overcome and therefore the boiling point of hydrogen is low 
excellent so before we do any more questions um let's move on to the q a then Yeah, brilliant. Um, I just wanted to say um, we're just going to have to end the session um, a little bit early today just because of some technical um, issues. I'm just worried um, it's going to get cut off. So we'll just take a couple of questions and then um, do you think that next time um, and we could just um, sort of start the next session finishing off with the last couple of questions on this topic? Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Brilliant. OK, um, there were very few questions. So um, there was just one question which was um, why are there two math sessions today? Um, there are two math sessions today because we're trialling splitting maths into foundation and higher levels. Um, this is based on feedback from you guys that some of you were struggling with the more um, uh, challenging content and some of you finding some of the content a bit too easy because you are obviously all at different levels and have been taught different things in school. So we're just testing that out and we welcome feedback um, on that. Um, let's have a look yeah um guys thank you so much for attending today unfortunately i'm gonna have to end there thank you um armin for a fantastic session um and hopefully see you guys in another chemistry session soon um and hopefully some people join us um for some of our other sessions today thanks guys.